All right, I'm finishing up chapter one of Alla Prima 2, talking about some of my favorite parts of it, and um, just letting you kind of know the content of the book in case you're thinking about purchasing it for yourself. I, of course, recommend it. I love this book. Uh, but some things that really have stood out to me, I've thought about a lot as I painted, I want to share with you. So there's another section, um, the next section from last week's video is called The Main Dish. And it says, avoid getting involved in what is called licking, in quotation marks, which is brushing in the same area over and over while you decide what to do next. It is the equivalent of daydreaming, a substitute for thinking. I have watched many painters do this unconsciously. If you have painted in a group, you too have probably noticed a person with a dazed expression locked into working on one small area of his or her painting, making the same brushwork over and over and over. If you are ever like that person, and we have all been, break the spell, take a break, go have a cup of coffee and a couple of brownies, works for me, come back and take a fresh look at where you are. Have another bite of brownie. Check out your picture in a mirror, a reverse image. Put your brush to your canvas. Look for the good work you've already done, then compare it to the goal image you've formed in your mind at the start. This reminds me a little bit of uh, working in Photoshop because in before painting, I was a photographer. And when we would work in Photoshop, if you would copy a section of the photo and stamp it over and over and over again, it, it looked photoshopped because it was like uh, 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 it was the same pattern over and over again or if we wanted to do a good job we would copy and paste to cover something take an area from somewhere else and copy and paste so that there wasn't a repeated pattern so he's essentially saying here don't paint in a way that's creating a pattern that is repetitive and I also like how he talks about flipping the image, looking at it in a mirror, bringing new eyes to it after taking a break. Something that I also think is helpful is looking at it in black and white, comparing, um, like if you take a picture of your, if you're painting and put it in black and white, and then um, if you're using a reference photo, which I often do, put the reference photo in black and white side to side, that's very revealing. In the next couple of pages, he covers when things go really wrong, and how he handles that with a process of elimination. And he, he does a lot of explanation, but ends up narrowing it down to two reasons. And he says there are only two reasons why the painting is going wrong. He says, the first is that, the, that he's painting something that is not there in the subject without a good reason. He's adding something to the, to the setup that's not there. Number two, He's not painting something that is there in the subject, but is essential for credibility or clarity. And I forgot about this the first time I read this, and as I have had a little more experience painting, I find this very enlightening because although I don't paint from life like he does, even if I'm using my photo reference, sometimes I don't know what to keep in and what to leave out when there's a lot of background elements and in a photo you'll usually have a few things in focus and then a lot of background that's out of focus but I don't always know automatically or right away what pieces of the background are necessary to make the composition look good what attracted me to that photo and why do I like it and how do I simplify it what needs to be included in my painting and what can I leave out for simplicity's sake so I find it interesting that he's talking about narrowing it down to what makes a painting work or not work is being these two things, is adding something not, that's not there or including something that is there that really shouldn't be there. It distracts from your composition. He says, I also know that those two arrows, errors can only occur within one or more of the four variable elements with my colors, values, drawing, edges, or some combination of all, or some of them, and nowhere else. That's kind of what he, um, what he rests the whole rest of the book on, is colors, value, drawing, edges, and he's got like very dense chapters based on each of those sections. 
In a section he calls what not to do, he goes into detail about how some artists will complain that their painting isn't working or the colors are wishy-washy and he talks about how unhelpful these descriptions are. Um, if the painting isn't working, then it's not helpful just to say it's not working. It's helpful to really pinpoint the description about what you don't like about it. Like um, the colors, they've, they've gotten too muddy, they're not clean enough, so they've mixed with other colors that you don't want, or, or it's too cool in this area and you need it to be a little bit more warmed up. And he, he says that um, those technical descriptions are much more helpful because they, they zero in on things we can fix rather than these abstract explanations that really don't have anything to do with how to fix it. It's just ambiguous and unhelpful. I really liked his list of common mistakes that he's made over the years. And I won't read all of them. There's just a few that really stand out to me because I make them too, but I find them comforting again because he's such a good painter and he's humble enough to share these weaknesses. Trying to understand exactly what art is, fear of making mistakes, worrying if what I'm painting will sell, timid painting, painting things instead of color shapes, painting more values than are necessary, inventing impossible color, miserly paint, too little paint, unsuitable or cheap brushes, painting very small without proper brushes, aimless brush strokes, faking it, showing off, believing I knew what art was when I was younger, trying to paint what I don't want to paint, wondering if I'll ever paint something important, worrying about recognition, boring paintings, not squinting for values and edges, too many highlights, painting shadows too light, pushing bright colors arbitrarily or increasing their saturation, inappropriate paint thickness, excessively thinned paint, painting over life size without a good reason, working too close, not stepping back frequently, overworking what should be left alone, trying to paint too much, especially detail, unsteady easel, not cleaning palette and brushes while working, failing to take good photos of my work, trying to paint what is not possible to paint, confusion, trying to do everything at once, poor working light, taking art critics seriously, taking myself too seriously. My favorite of all of those is probably the worrying about recognition or wondering if, I, if I'll paint something important. Um, sometimes with limited time and ability, we just, we want to spend it in something so meaningful rather than painting for the sake of painting and, or painting for ourselves, painting what you think will sell rather than what you like or, or what you would put on your wall something that you care about enough that it's hard to sell because you love it so much. That's kind of been a shift in some of my goals and priorities lately that I think is good, but it also really opens my eyes to how much I don't paint that way. And I really want to get to that place within myself and within a style that I've created that I can love for its own sake. If that makes sense. Schmid ends the chapter with sort of a letter to the readers and it's very inspiring and lovely. Uh, the, the paragraph that I'll share out of it that was sort of my favorite and spoke to me as a beginner is toward the middle. He says, our culture commonly holds that we artists have received a gift, a special talent others do not have. I think a much better word for what we have access to is opportunity. For whatever reason, circumstances in our lives have somehow converged to offer us a golden chance to pursue a life of creativity. The freedom, without passing judgment or causing intentional harm, to express almost anything we wish in a way we choose. That much is all we know for certain. The rest is sheer guesswork. One thing, however, stands out and ought never to be ignored. It is that the opportunity offered us is a most precious one and it is not to be accepted lightly. So that's the end of chapter one. Chapter two in future videos is alla prima or direct painting. And I can't remember what that means, but that's what's next.